man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. Teacher, he declared, all these I've done, I've kept them since I'm a small boy. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around, and he said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at its words, but Jesus said it again. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed, and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and he said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Then Peter spoke up. We've left everything for you to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. The researchers called it brain shift. It's a phenomena that helps explain why we are prone to make a whole lot of really stupid boneheaded decisions. And it's a fascinating read. I really did enjoy uh, kind of uh, wrapping my head around some of the ideas in it. They gave an example that in one study, they had a person, they were doing all these, they had hired a bunch of temp employees and they set up this temporary office and uh, one, the, one of the employees was sitting there with a bunch of other employees, and smoke began to billow into the area where they were all working. And it started filling the ceiling, like up on the, the ceiling, it started filling it up with smoke. And no one left. No one would leave the room. And then, of course, what in the world is going on, right? Your, your mom used to say, if all your friends jump off a bridge, would you follow? Well, apparently, if all of your friends remain sitting in a building that's on fire, you will too. Because all of the other people there, the employees, were part of the experiment, except one. And that person just locked down solid in their seat, even though smoke was beginning to fill the building. When they interviewed people later about why they would do something that was so clearly insane, they said they didn't even really see the smoke. And this kind of a study has been repeated time and time and time again. Or at least they didn't understand or see the risk. They, they took their cues from something else. And the researchers are showing that what actually takes place is, again, what they call brain shift, which is the brain misreads the situation because of any variety of circumstances that might be going on. So afterwards, when a person says to you, well, I just, I mean, it's just, it didn't seem like the right thing to do. It didn't seem like the right decision. They're not, they're not making that up often. They actually, in the moment, really did see the situation differently. Researchers tell us that this helps explain why famous politicians will send career-ending inappropriate texts or why a highly trained officer will mistake a taser for a gun in a moment of crisis. They'll say, they, they, they let us know that a highly trained 
doctor who has been shown the research, told again and again and again, the risks of not washing their hands be between two different patients' rooms, why one in three times they will forget. They will not do it. And they're saying that this isn't malicious, that there's some shift that is taking place in the brain that's causing us to misread circumstances and situations around us. And they say that the phenomena holds true regardless of intelligence or your morality or your past behaviors. That this shows up across the board in many situations. But the situations where it is most common will involve money, sex, and fame. They're catalysts for bringing on this brain shift. So I'm reading this study and I can't help but think to myself, Jesus already knew all this about us. Like 2,000 years ago, he's giving, us, he's giving us insight into modern psychology, which I always find a really interesting reality about the scriptures. And we find out that if we want to combat it, we have to first recognize that we are in fact all vulnerable to it. And if you can recognize that you're vulnerable, if you can have the humility to admit that perhaps I might not be making the best decision or see things as accurately as I ought to, then we begin to wrestle with our fears and our desires. And if you wrestle with your fears and your desires, there's a very good chance that you'll be able to mitigate the effects of brain shift. As followers of Jesus, we call that whole process discipleship. We call it following Jesus, submitting our lives to him no matter what he calls us to. And so here, last week, we looked at the rich young ruler, the text that Pastor Eddie just read for us. We met him last week, and he was faced with this decision when he was confronted by this challenge that Jesus laid out for him. And of course, we saw that we are faced with the same decision. Now, this really is like part two of the message. And so yeah, I'm going to do a quick, quick, quick review. But uh, if there's pieces of it that are not particularly clear, it might be because I covered some of it last week and would encourage you to go check it out online. But by way of quick review, we saw that the rich young ruler here is asking the right question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And last week we saw that there is this age this present age as the scriptures talk about it. It's a concept that the Jewish people fully understood. It's this age, and this age has lots of great things happening in it, but it also is the age where the wicked will continue to thrive, where war and disease is, is rampant. This age is a hard age. And even though we take some great joy and we can extract some value out of it, it is a difficult age because it is the age where sin and rebellion and our enemy, the spiritual enemy of humanity, rules. This present age. And so when this guy asks about eternal life, he's not just talking about like our version of what kind of what we grew up in thinking about heaven. He's, not, he's talking about this idea of how there is the present age and of course there is the age to come. Jesus even mentions it here in the text, but the age to come is the age where God rules, where our, our weapons are beaten into plowshares so that we can feed the world's hungry and where every, every tear is wiped away and where every shame and guilt is forgiven. And that, this is the age to come. It's the promise. It's the hope of the human heart. And most every world religion or philosophy has some version of the age to come. And it makes sense because the scriptures tell us that eternity is written in our hearts, that we know it, that we, we know what we ought, what we were made for. And we were made for this age to come, the age where God is truly king and rules. And so this guy, he's not hung up, the rich young ruler. He knows that this age is temporary age. The age to come is actually what really, really matters in God's economy and in fact to us. And this, this sharp dude, he gets it because he recognizes that what happens in this age does matter for the age to come. They're not separate. They're not distinct. It matters. 
What we do here, how we spend our lives here, what we invest in here isn't just for now and it isn't just for five years and it isn't just for 10. It's not even for just 100 years. It is for the age to come, the forever age where we will live and serve and be with our creator. Now, we saw last week as well that Jesus challenges many of our beliefs about how to get to the age to come. And again, I won't be able to develop them again here, but just by way of review, we see that sincerity in your pursuit of Jesus isn't enough. The rich young ruler, super sincere, Jesus still challenges him. He pushes back and he says, sincerity isn't enough. We also saw that living life as a good person isn't enough. And this is perhaps one of the most disturbing of the things that Jesus tells us. This idea that simply being a good person, comparing yourself to other people, thinking that you're doing pretty good, it simply isn't enough to inherit the age to come, to receive the age to come. And we also saw that achieving success in this age isn't enough. And so if you're in the text, you can open up to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. We're kind of picking up right from there. It's kind of a little bit where we wrapped up uh, from last week. And we're going to quickly see that Jesus goes and he, calls to, and he calls us to follow and obey him no matter the cost. That's what we saw with this rich young ruler. And we also talked about the fact that it, it, for the rich young ruler, it had to do with his money. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But we also noted last week that for the main point of this is that, that Jesus calls us to surrender everything to him, to offer it all up to him, because he is, in fact, the only one who understands what it is and how it is that we ought to live in this age to maximize the age to come. And one of the things we pick up from this text is that it is, it's hard to follow Jesus. It's hard to do it. And I, I think sometimes when we're talking to people about following Jesus, we forget that point. You know, we're like, oh, yeah, it's all fantastic. It's rainbows and butterflies. No offense, Chris Bell. But it, like, it's like, you know, that's like we kind of like, but like Jesus, it, it, it's hard. And so many times when we see people encounter Jesus, he doesn't like, you know, like lower the bar. He raises it up. And he's like, you've got to understand what it really means to come and follow me. And so this man's face, it says it fell. These dark clouds sort of appeared over his face. He went away sad. The disciples, they were amazed. They were shocked. They were like, what is going on? They even said, who then can be saved? Like, this is, this is a hard teaching. Jesus himself said it was impossible without God's intervention. And then he throws in there for, you know, good measure, even among persecutions. Right? He meant, he's got to always mention the persecutions. You're like, really? That's what I'm signing up for, persecutions? Because that's not what I was hoping for. Because in many ways, if you read through a text like this, it really seems like a good decision to not follow Jesus. So that's a really good decision. Don't follow Jesus and skip all of this harsh impossibility, persecution, sacrifice, and all of this other stuff. We can just kind of be done with that. So then why is it? If it's so patently obvious, why is it that anybody would want to follow Jesus? What in the world did he do to convince this guy that it was actually a good thing to follow him other than put the bar so high that the guy had to walk away broken and sad? Well, look at verse 17. And we get to start seeing a hint here. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees, and he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Scholars point out that the phrasing here for he started on his way is picked up later in the Gospel of Mark for Jesus on his way to the cross. And so if you were reading this Gospel for the second or third or fourth time, you would heard this story told, you would start to pick up this little, narrative, this little narrative clue that Jesus is actually on his way. And the whole Gospel of Mark is structured around this idea that Jesus is singularly focused on one destination, and that destination is the cross. Well, why is he heading to the cross? He's heading to the cross for us because he desperately loves us. Now, it might be a little too subtle, but there are scholars who point out that it's a real possibility that as people started to pick this up, this was already a hint here in the text, but it gets much more obvious than that. In verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. He looked at him and he loved him. 
I kind of have this picture that Jesus, he's sort of like, you know, with his eyes and with his words and even, you know, perhaps with his arms, he's just kind of draw, drawing this guy in. He's trying to pull him closer. You ever meet those people? They can just, they can just sort of pull you closer. And the text can indicate even that, that he might have just even put his arm around this guy and he might have been like, there's just, there's just one thing you lack because the motivation here is that Jesus loved him. He loved him. He had compassion on him. And he is inviting him to pursue eternal life. He's inviting you to pursue eternal life. He's not trying to get away from you. He's not like done with you. He's not like, you know, a parent who's a little overwhelmed that their kids are a little bit too much. And they're like, I just need a little bit of a break. Jesus isn't like that. He doesn't need a little bit of a break. I love the far side. And there's a great far side where it says, the Arnolds feign death until the Wagners, sensing the sudden awkwardness, are compelled to leave. So if you've ever had guests that won't leave your house and you're just kind of done, you're an introvert and you're like, can they just leave? And they're not willing to take the hint and you're yawning and you're checking your watch. And so finally you can just fake death. And eventually they will awkwardly get the hint. And you're like, sometimes we feel like Jesus is like, I'm just sick of you all. Give me a break. I'm going to have to go to the cross and feign death so that you will leave. And of course, this is not this is as far from the truth as you could possibly get. Jesus is headed to the cross because he desperately loves you because he knows that in his suffering, he is offering you up an incredible privilege of being with him for all of time and that's what he wants. You'll never overstay your welcome with him. Jesus makes these hard commands for our good. One thing you lack. It's like a doctor's compassionate explanation that that there's a tumor where it ought not to be that's got to come out. And you wouldn't look at that doctor and be like, man, that's that's mean. I can't believe you would say that. That's compassionate. They might have said it a little mean. That's possible. But the point is, of course, that the hard thing they're saying is for your good. And Jesus comes along and he's saying, listen, there is one thing you lack. It is hard. It needs to be hard. But it is not cruel. It's for our good. Even in verse 24, it says, The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus again said, Children. The word here, it's super tender. It's an unusual word for children. He's like, it's his little ones. He's like calling them. Remember, he's like 33 years old. And he's calling his disciples for some, you know, of the people in the crowd are no doubt older. He's like, Children. My little one's like, please. He's trying to pull them closer. He's trying to draw them in. He's trying to give them a hard lesson because they need it desperately. And then Jesus goes so far as to make him take action. He needed him to do something, right? He said, one, one thing you lack. And then actually he did something super, I love it. He actually hits him with four things, right? He's like, go, sell, give, and follow. These are all the commands of the one thing, which I think is a really great old preacher trick that you, you know, you get to have one point, but you stuff it with a whole lot of sub points. And so like you can kind of list out all of these other things, which is why I do that because I'm trying to be a good follower of Jesus and Jesus did it. And so I'm doing it. So I stuff as many points as I can into my main point. Um, and so here I am back in my notes at sub point five of B of section two of my main point. So here we go. That Jesus, he promises blessing upon blessing. And it's just, he's so lavish with these. For any who will invest in him and in his mission. Verse 28, then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. It's as if Jesus is saying, guys, this is the smart decision. This is actually just plain good business. If you want to talk about A real ROI here? This is it. This is good business. Jim Elliott penned these words in 1949. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain, that which he cannot lose. We find them in his journal of 1949. 
And I thought, man, these are some pretty heady words for a young man of about 22 years old who had just graduated from Wheaton Bible College. A few months after he wrote this, around 1950s, a missionary told Jim about a tribe of completely unreached people in Ecuador, the Heirani. And Jim Elliott felt a call from God on his life to go reach them with the good news of the love of Jesus. And by 1952, Jim and his friends were in Ecuador already learning Spanish so that they could fulfill their call, this mission. A year later, he married Elizabeth Elliott. And a short time after that, Valerie, their daughter, was born. This is 1955. Now, with a new, new family, I think few people would have thought twice if Jim said, you know, I think it's time to reevaluate what I'm doing, where I'm going, and the risks that I'm about to take with my life. I mean, I have other responsibilities. I've got a wife. I've got a child. I think many would have said, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Maybe we'll bring you back stateside. We'll hook you up in an office. We'll do some other stuff. But, like, we can do some really great stuff. But, like, this going out there, probably not a great idea, especially because this particular tribe, the Heirani, they were well known uh, for killing anyone that came into their territory. And so that's why they were an unreached people group, because they would kill everyone that came to reach them, anyone who violated their territory. So a couple years, they decide that they're going to make contact with the tribe after all. They're going to figure out how to do it in a plane and a rope and a bucket, and they start communicating in this way without actually having to meet them in person. And they feel like they've started to build some trust with the tribe. And so on January 6th, 19, I'm sorry, January 3rd, 1956, they land on a beach near the tribe. And on January 6th, they made first contact with a couple of members of the Hirabi tribe. And so... Everything goes great, this first contact. Great news, a couple days later, they waited with great anticipation when they realized that a larger contingent of the Heirani were on their way to meet them. This is great news. They're finally making inroads. They send back the message. They tell everyone this is happening. And on January 8th, 1956, Jim Elliott and his friends were speared to death all murdered right on the beach upon which they had recently landed. It is hard to imagine that Jim Elliott could have understood the significance of these words for his own life a few short years later. That this would be played out in such an incredible and a powerful way. And yet here he was claiming before this that any time that we cling to the things of this age in exchange for the things of that age, it is a foolish move. And it is wise. It is the right decision. It is a good decision to give up that which means nothing for eternity, for that which means everything forever. So now we have to wrestle with this reality that Jesus kind of piles up here on the rich. He highlights them here and in a lot of other places. In verse 24, he actually says, children, how hard it is for, for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He says in verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This is some pretty difficult stuff to hear. So years ago, I, many, many years ago, like t- more than 20, 25, 30 years ago, I had heard the explanation for this text, which I proceeded to teach to a whole lot of people uh, for some years. And that is that it's a tough thing, but it's not impossible because you have, in Israel, you have a gate. Uh, and in warfare, you lower your gates. And in times of high stress, at night even, they'll lift the gate a little bit, but they won't lift it all the way. Because if they lift it all the way, then an enemy could jump out of hiding and run into the city and conquer the city just like that. And because, you know, an army can usually hide right outside a city so well. But anyway, the idea was that that opening of the gate was called the eye of the needle. 
So it's not that it was impossible, but it was difficult. You see, you could teach a camel to get down on its knees and shimmy through this little gate, this little opening in the gate. So it's really, really hard, but you can do it if you work real hard at it. And so I loved that idea. It sounded so smart and, and historic, and it was something people hadn't heard, so I was super impressed because I could tell it to them, and they would be like, wow, that's something I hadn't heard, and you heard it from me because I'm smart. And so, like, I loved it. I taught it for quite a while. Then I find out it has no bearing in history whatsoever. It doesn't show up for, like, a thousand years. Some preacher thought it was a great story, probably because he had trouble with Jesus saying it was impossible. Once you read the text and you realize Jesus actually says, no, it is impossible, then you realize that even the explanation violates the text. And so there is no gate, there is no opening, there is no teaching a camel to shimmy through. It really is a little needle, and it really is a camel, and it really is impossible. And Jesus was making fun of us in this moment, saying, look, go ahead and stuff this camel through. That's what it's going to be like to get you into heaven. This is some tough stuff. But truly, without Christ, impossible. How could he say this? Now, I want to sketch for you a very quick overview on the biblical teaching of money, stewardship and stuff. We don't talk about it a lot um, here at Beacon, but it is very, very helpful in the realm of disciple-making to understand what this, what the Bible perspective is on, kind of the minimum perspective is on giving. And so the early church would have no doubt adopted the principles of generosity and giving and things like that from the Jewish practices that had been established in the Old Testament, which would be giving 10% of their earnings to the temple. This was so that the temple could remain a vibrant place for worship, spiritual instruction, there would be sacrifices to be made, there was the support of the priests, and of course it was a resource for the poor and for foreigners to name just a few of the things. They call it the tithe. Tithe just means the tenth. And so if you harvested ten apples, you would give an apple. I don't think they had apples back then. Figs, you know, ten bushels of figs, you give a bushel of figs to the temple. And so it was a 10% of your earnings. In the book of Malachi, Old Testament prophet, there's this passage that actually sounds a lot like ours, so it's pretty interesting. So God is telling the people that they have abandoned him. And he is telling them to return. And this is so curious because he tells them to bring the whole of the tithe into the storehouses of the temple. So he says to them, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? There's lots of ways we would give to answer that question on how you return to God, repentance and all of this. It's what you would have expected him to say to the rich young ruler 700 years later. But instead, God here in Malachi chapter 3, he says, for the Italians you can call it Malachi. He says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you asked, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. He goes on to say, you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. It's as if when Jesus met with this rich young ruler, he had been doing his devotions that morning in Malachi chapter 3. Because it's nearly the same idea. He's largely telling him, listen, I'm going to give you blessing upon blessing upon blessing. You are going to have to give away your stuff. And there's a test of the soul that's going on here. There would also be a whole multitude of other offerings, grain offerings and animal sacrifices and money offered to the temple and all of, of this kind of stuff. So on top of the tithe, they would give their free will offerings of grain and oil, and then they gave to those people who were in need, uh, kind of above and beyond that. They offered their homes to travelers and to foreigners, and they offered their grain in their fields, and even more than that to the poor. And so the whole of the Old Testament is filled with this incredible rich generosity that the Jewish nation had been taught by God himself. And then in the New Testament, we see the same sort of an idea happening. And the gist of it really does seem comparable to what the Jewish people would have expected. 
right? And so in the New Testament, we do the same thing. We give. Why? Support the teachers, the apostles, the evangelists. We take up collections for the poor. We do it in a, in a way that is proportionate with your income. That idea of proportionate sounds a whole lot like the Old Testament idea of the tithe. And so if you take all of these biblical ideas together and you boil them down, then we get to see that Christians give 10% of their income to their church, then offerings on top of that as the Lord leads. Any additional generosity is still something between you and God, and you should expect that you would be privileged with lots of opportunities for continuing generosity toward individuals and toward organizations that are trying to do the work that God has called them to. Now, if that wasn't enough, which I know it is already, and that's just the rudimentary teaching on the scriptures on this thing, we find out that Jesus and in the New Testament, the, the New Testament in general, they make the whole thing much more intense. They make the whole thing intense. They add a sort of recklessness to the giving and a redistribution of wealth in a way that makes a lot of us uncomfortable. And he offers lots of warnings like this one that we have in our text here. And in all of it, what we see is that Jesus is teaching us how to shake free of the dangers associated with money. So I think it's really helpful for us to reflect on our own lives and ask, why is it that wealth is such a threat to following Jesus? Why is it? And in my years of working with people, I have seen this show up so many times. In the own, in my own examination of my own soul, I have seen it show up so many times. I've seen how money brings a sort of superficial contentment. It numbs us in this age so that we don't really think about or reflect on the age to come. It's some sort of superficial happiness that just kind of masks a deeper longing in the soul. We also see that money will breed other sins. Selfishness, pride, greed, covetousness. I'm checking out the Met Gala and all of the, the, the fantastic outfits that people wore there, right? And uh, you can't help but think Hunger Games, right? Like at some point, was anyone else thinking Capital District, Hunger Games, all these people dressed like this? I was waiting like for someone to say, you know, may the odds be ever in your favor. And, you know, and then outside I heard there were protesters. I'm like, I hope somebody out there is doing the, the salute out in the front being like, you guys, really, what in the world is going on? And you do, you do a deep dive into that whole culture and you're like, yeah, I could see how money breeds a whole lot of other kinds of sins. You know, we have a friend, he turned down a promotion because it would interfere with their pursuit of the kingdom of God. And I think whenever a Christ follower does something like that, we ought to celebrate it. We ought to be able to cheer them on. We ought to be like, man, that is awesome. You're making countercultural sacrifices for the age to come. Good for you. And I think, I think money also affords us the luxury of doing lots of things and buying lots of things. And we are more privileged in this day and age than in any age before us in these ways. And those activities and all of those possessions, they return the favor by monopolizing our lives. By taking more of our time and our energy and our focus and they sort of endlessly distract us. There's also this other more subtle thing that I think goes on. I think that we convince ourselves that money is equal to God's blessing. How many times we use this language and we use it super carelessly. I've done it many, many, many times. So in Jesus' day, wealth, prosperity, notoriety, fame, they were often seen as God's blessing. Can you imagine that? Shocking that anyone would ever think that. And yet, such it is. And I've seen it in my own heart. I've seen it in the struggle that many, many, many folks who I have spoken to and worked with and discipled and taught over the years, we've seen it many times. So what, is this, what does this mean? Well, I think it's, it's easy for us, if we've ever experienced any sort of pride or selfishness or greed as a result of our money, to recognize that he's talking to us, that we're the rich in the story. I think we like to talk about others as being the rich people, but I think if you've ever substituted your financial success for contentment with God, if you've ever slipped into the lie that your financial abundance is proof of God's blessing and favor in your life, then that's 
this message is for you. This, then you are the rich, and I am the rich that he is talking to. If you have ever been so distracted by your stuff that time with God is elusive, then this is for us. And I think it's important for us to remember it. You know, most of the world, when they heard of the murder of Jim Elliot and his four friends, they called it a great tragedy. Life cut short. And for what? A young widow and their child, not a year old. This is terrible. What a loss. She could have done so much for the kingdom. Had his life not, this is a tragic nightmare. Elizabeth Elliot, she saw it very differently than that. She memorialized the whole story of her husband's death and the work of those missionaries. She and others recognized the providence of God in the deaths of those missionaries. And the result, of course, was a missionary movement that had now become one of the largest and most mobilized and effective missionary thrusts in modern history. More money and people went into the deep mission field after the death of Jim Elliott than we could have ever possibly imagined or ever would have seen happen if it had not been for the sacrifice of Elliot and his friends. A few years after their death, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel, the sister of one of the other men killed, actually continued with their husband's work. They went back into Ecuador and it eventually led to the conversion of many of the Heirani, including some of the very people who were involved in the killing of their family. Their efforts largely eliminated tribal, tribal violence among the Heirani, and many of them came to faith, and you can hear their stories on YouTube and videos. And so here's Jim Elliott ushered what seemed too early into his heavenly home, and yet he has treasure in heaven. We're so busy, we're earning and we're spending and we're investing all of our worldly treasure. We're collecting our stuff, we're achieving our things, we're polishing up our reputations, and we have so little time left to actually love others the way Christ is calling us to love them. So will we actually have treasure in heaven? Because it isn't simply about getting to heaven, it's about investing in heaven with a wealth that will never perish will never be exhausted. We can use our resources, our money in this age to bless many, to lift heavy hearts, to reach lost people, to invest in the coming kingdom with a return on investment unlike anything that we had ever imagined possible. I can imagine Jim Elliott, he's in heaven, he's walking the, you know, these streets of gold, whatever the picture is you have in your head, he's walking the streets of gold. I, can't, I imagine he can't get more than a few blocks without someone running out and saying, Jim Elliott, man, you don't know me, but years after your death, a missionary showed up in my town, in my village. Oh man, I heard your story and I was inspired to live in a different way and I became a follower of Jesus because of that story. You want to talk about a guy whose investment is in the age to come? You want to know what it's like to experience wealth in the age to come? Imagine an endless line of people for generations after you were dead who trace their story of salvation back to your effort, your work, your love for them, your sacrifice for them. Wealth, true wealth in the age to come. We follow Jesus and we re radically reorient everything helping others follow Jesus, reaching lost people, growing us up into full maturity, a gift and a privilege that Jesus loves us enough to call us into. Would you pray with me? Father, what we need from you is this kind of perspective. We get so cloudy here. We get so foggy here. We don't quite see what really matters. We, don't, we, we, we can't value things the way we ought because we just see today and tomorrow and the next 10 or 20 years. Lord, this isn't the people that we want to be. Stir up our hearts in your great love. Press your compassion into us. Give us an eternal perspective for the age to come. For those who are far from you, stir up our hearts jostle us free from our idols, Lord, so that we might do this and so much more, more than we could ever hope or imagined.
as you pour out blessing upon blessing. We pray it in Christ's name. God's people said, amen.